Hi everyone and welcome to the 17th edition of the Disruptive Fridays. The edition started in the beginning of the lockdown in April 2020 and in the meantime developed as our online program series. Since October, it is also funded by the European Cultural Foundation, which uh, helps us keeping it going. Uh, in the beginning, I would like to thank Elizabeth Glauser from the Boiling, Media, Boiling Head Media uh, for the production of this edition and the great support from the whole Disruption Network Lab team. Uh, please don't forget to, to check our website and follow our channels for the upcoming 23rd conference uh, named Behind the Mask, Whistleblowing During the Pandemic, uh, that will take place from the 18th uh, to 20th of March. I will say something more about the conference at the end of the edition, but uh, it's the conference and the program are fully streamed for free, so we would really like you to join us for this uh, upcoming event. So uh, also, before we go into the details for this edition, I would really like to ask you to actively join the chat on our website and uh, ask questions to our guests because uh, we will be picking them up in the last part of our talk. And this is really meaningful to us to hear your voice in this conversation. So as we announced it, uh, today's topic is uh, radical healthcare, or as a subtitle, rather feminist healthcare practices. Uh, we will have uh, this conversation with the artists and researchers that are here with me in the studio. Uh, the Collective Feminist Healthcare Research Group, consisting, consisting of Inga Zimprich and uh, Julia Bond, uh, and the art, artist and researcher Luisa Prado. So I'm really happy to have you uh, with me here today. Uh, as a short introduction, uh, uh, past year uh, has been really the year of health uh, as the global pandemic only emphasized our vulnerability, the need for a better organized and more inclusive institutionalized healthcare system. But uh, older than the pandemic is the need for a more embracing and inclusive health practice. And under this umbrella of services, uh, many social groups are underrepresented uh, and their specific needs uh, are not acknowledged or they are under-researched, uh, as many specific women's needs, the needs of displaced people, people of color, people with disabilities or specific needs of trans and non-binary people, really the list is more than exhaustible. But uh, as this topic is as complex as it sounds, uh, today we will tackle many of these issues, but not uh, be able to cover them all. So we will try to discuss uh, radical feminist health practices and how they tackle to uh, the power mechanisms over gender, race and class. Of course, we will expand on this. Uh, and we will go through the research practice of my guests and see how we could use their insights in order to empower and think not only about the medical side of health, but also the emotional needs of sick and vulnerable people, as well as the power relations and political decisions that affect huge populations. So uh, first, uh, I would give the word to the, the Collective Feminist Healthcare Research Group, who has already done enormous empowering work in this field, and especially going through the, some historical radical healthcare practices in Germany, from the 70s and the 80s of the last century, as well as uh, how the health movement challenges uh, some classes and patriarchal medicine and proposes radical forms of medical uh, self-empowerment. But I will really not go into detail about their work because they, they will uh, really introduce uh, what they are uh, doing at the moment and previously. So please, Inga and Julia, uh, feel free to share your experience with us. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much, Elena, for um, the invitation and also for your introduction. So Julia and I are here with you today. Julia Bonn and me, Inga Zimbrich, we are right now the Feminist Healthcare Research Group as a duo. And Feminist Healthcare Research Group was founded in 2015 in Berlin as an artistic project or a project situated in cultural work. Um, it came forth from self-organized practices in the arts and the desire to set up um, a self-empowering um, research in a collective 
that would enable cultural workers to do work on healthcare at all. Because my personal experience and motivation was that I feel the field of healthcare is very omnipresent in our lives um, and at the same time very regulated and very expert dominated. And when we have personal experiences with healthcare, we are very often in the position of need, of needing therapy or specialist advice or feeling also helpless um, when confronted with the bureaucracy in the healthcare system. Thus, the idea was that we would uh, develop a group's practice how we would gradually learn more about healthcare in a self-empowering and feminist way. And uh, at the beginning, the group was larger and we had two meetings where we went to visit existing alternative um, counseling places and healthcare initiatives in Berlin, like, let's say, the Antipsychiatric Information Center, the Feminist Women's Health Center, Heile House, the Healing House, um, and uh, other places that offer alternative um, voices, different perspectives on health issues. And um, after a while, we found out that those initiatives that were very inspiring uh, for us were all initiated in the late 70s and early 80s in Berlin at the overlap of second wave feminism and the squatting scene. And um, Julia and I in 2018 started to dive much deeper into uh, the, health, the health movement, which was active at that time and which just produced quite, we think, empowering and radical forms how healthcare can be done differently. For instance, uh, doctors' collectives, a pharmacist collective, as a, um, the pharmacy as a political place that would educate people about um, medicine, that would like challenge uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and um, yeah, like we developed a research-based exhibition and a publication on the health movement. Um, it was also part of the last Berlin Biennio, and you find a lot of different interviews with protagonists of the health movement there. And our aim is and was to like, maybe just recover and um, share practices that were developed at that time and also ask how we can uh, actualize them today or how we can put them into use today. Um, for instance, we came across um, vaginal self-examinations, which were a very important instrument in second wave feminism. And I was thinking about um, Paula Pin um, from Ginepunks in Barcelona as one example of people who are queering this, this second wave feminist practice to make it trans inclusive and develop it further. Well, and in the last year, um, as we were part of the, the Berlin Biennial, we developed a workshop there uh, on one of our hot topics also before the pandemic. How can we um, support each other in uh, moments of emotional crisis? Um, it was always in the Feminist Healthcare Research Group, this was one of the main topics. Um, what is our social internalized and learned understanding of emotional and mental well-being? Why is emotional crisis so stigmatized and tabooed? And how can we create more space in our work also as cultural workers, but also in our friendships to accommodate moments of crisis? And how can we support each other? And um, I'm just briefly showing this. This is our latest zine from last year with illustrations by Tina Kaden on being in crisis together. And we compiled this zine with uh, a long list of resources of places for counseling, consultation, online resources, groups, um, and feature interviews with radical health initiatives on mental health in Berlin. And we share some of our methods that we usually share in our workshops. I think that's it from the start, for the start from us. Um, yeah, passing back to you.
<laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I made the most common mistake. Uh, Julia, I think you also wanted to add a little bit, expand on your practice, so please uh, go ahead. I just wanted to add a few things that um, uh, what is um, from the beginning that our research was um, very much experience based and that we were like departing from our own experiences as um, uh, humans uh, con being confronted by uh, medical, the medical field and um, that everything that we research uh, is not like an abstract kind of research that is distance from us. Um, but that it's, it very much has an impact on our um, on our art practice, but also on our lives as well. Um, so this is, is, I think this is very much important in our work and um, everything that we, like the methods that we learn, we, we try them out, we try to put them into practice and we see what works, what doesn't work, what we can develop further, where we can be in exchange with other people. Like in the, in the last zine, we, we um, interviewed three initiatives and we it's like a continuing learning experience that very much has an impact on on us as well okay then maybe i have one uh, sub question uh, because as you mentioned let's start maybe from here and then we can expand on the other because you have also researched a lot uh, back in the historical movements uh, in this respect in Germany. Uh, I'm curious which aspects of your past research uh, or work inform your current work the most? <laughs> what was the biggest inspiration? <laughs> if you like, I can go. I can also let you speak, Julia. Like, um, or hey. one by one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I have the feeling that, um, <laughs> like, I think what is uh, most radical at the moment is to um, to really open up frameworks where we can engage with each other and where we, I was thinking about this before, that it's not just to support each other and to open frameworks of care, but to also start to begin to hold each other accountable. So as Julia was saying that we are learning mm -hmm. and um, I think there's a lot of people who are aiming to move forwards and politicize their practices more and I think this is a very important moment in time where we um, where it is time for alliances and for challenging each other and um, yeah maybe the, the practices we are mostly focusing on right now is how we can develop functioning support networks when it comes to uh, autonomous health and mutual support in, um, yeah, in, for instance, um, anti-psychiatric practices, radical therapy practices, feminist therapy practices. Maybe you can um, continue, Julia. I wanted uh, one of the things that was that people were, uh, were not experts. Are you, can you hear me? Yeah, now it's yes? good. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, that they that uh, they were not necessarily experts when they um, exchanged these experiences and when they were so forming these um, networks of support. That but that but that everyone was bringing their own expertise and still it was able like everyone was able to bring something and learn from the others. And this is also something that we in these networks of support that we um, are trying to create now or that we are creating now that we um, we manage to not do uh, that we don't have to do all the that we don't have to have read everything and have to, the whole expertise that one can gather around a topic but that we can still bring our expertise and learn from one another and be supportive for one another i think that this was one of the very um very actually simple and yet radical things that we took. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I will not go deeper now into the topic uh, with you because I would like to introduce uh, our second speaker, uh, Luisa Prado. 
So, and then we can all, yeah, we will continue with the discussion. This is not the, the end of it. Uh, the work of Louisa focuses on the control over fertility and reproduction as a foundational biopolitical gesture for the establishment of the colonial modern gender system. This is, as I said, another vast topic, but uh, I would like to ask Louisa to give us first <laughs> her brief introduction into her work, and then we can maybe dive into the more uh, yeah, concrete discussion. So go ahead. Thank you, uh, Elena, Julia, Inga, Elizabeth, and the Disruption Lab for this great invitation. Um, so to give you a little bit of a background, I mean, I know the, the, that description is a bit of a mouthful, biopolitical gesture and everything, um, but to give you a little bit of background and a little bit, a little bit of context of where I'm coming from, um, I'm a founding member of a, bro a group called Decolonizing Design and uh, now also the vice director of the Center for Other Worlds at the Lusophone University in Lisbon. And since 2013, and now you're going to get why the mouthful, uh, since 2013, I've been researching questions around gender and decolonization. Um, as part, it started as part of my PhD at the University of the Arts here in Berlin. Um, and uh, one thing that became quite clear, you know, my first impulse was to kind of understand the articulations of gender with um, with the colonial um, so with colonial structures of power. Uh, but one thing that became quite clear right in the beginning of my research was how actually the control over reproduction and fertility and all the processes related to that was actually a fundamental gesture, um, of, like a foundational aspect of coloniality and the enactment of and maintenance of colonial power. Um, that was, I guess, like back in 2013 when I was beginning my PhD and um, I started researching all these technologies. I was doing my PhD in, uh, in design at the UDK. And uh, I started researching all these technologies and looking into things like the birth control pill and the, um, the, clinical, uh, the clinical tests that were done in people in Puerto Rico, for instance, as part of the, um, of the development process of the pill. Um, I started looking at tests that, uh, by the way, were highly unethical um, and exploitative of the people of Puerto Rico. Um, this was in the 1950s. So if you think about it, this is not long ago. This is within people's lifetimes. There are people alive today that were alive then. Um, but this is also something that didn't really stay in the 1950s. As you know, I started researching, I started seeing that um, as kind of a, a recurring thing, something that was happening, you know, like in the 1500s um, uh, with, of course, the colonization of the Americas and the exploitation that, that was also uh, reproductive and sexual exploitation that was part of the colonizing process. Uh, but that, you know, that history stretched all the way to today um, to the point that, um, I mean, there's so many manifestations of that that you keep seeing over and over again, happening over and over again. Uh, from, for instance, I would say um, a very glaring and recent example, um, the uh, dictatorship of uh, Alberto Fujimori in Peru, how um, they enacted a whole program of sterilization of indigenous women in the 90s or how in prisons in the United States in the past decade, that is in the 2010s, were also um, sterilizing involuntarily or, uh, um, yeah, sterilizing involuntarily uh, incarcerated people um, or even a horrendous experiment that, uh, I mean, experiment is even, a uh, I'm not even sure if it's the appropriate word, but um, I would say more crime. Um, but, uh, but for instance, how um, in the, the detention camps in the United States, um, there was um, uh, a situation where 
they experimented in um, a, an, a so-called abortion reversal method on a teenage girl that was detained there. So there's this is happening over and over again, and you see um, these colonial uh, powers, imperial powers, you know, from the um, from like the the European uh, kingdoms and um, and empires that were expanding in the 1500s until uh, the let's say the the um, modern colonial nation state uh, that is formed. Uh, or the modern colonial nation states in the Americas today um, to, yeah, the imperial power of the United States. You see that happening over and over again. So that was research that I was doing for four years. Uh, as I said, um, it was really the main theme of my PhD. Um, and, you know, I was doing a PhD in design, so I was uh, particularly also interested in how um, the shape of certain technologies also um, works to uh, to facilitate certain uh, certain um, uses or certain ways of distributing and and enforcing these reproductive regimes. Um, you know, the birth control pill is something that you have to take every day, and you have to actively. Um, work to uh, to take it. It has to. There's a very specific intake regime that goes into something like that. But when we start talking about implants, for instance, that's a little bit different because implant is not as easy to stop as a pill. So there's all these factors that kind of go into this, and uh, it was, to be honest, um, quite harsh to look into this for four years you know it's uh it's a history of extreme violence and um to to see that still happening and the presence of this in uh, in people's everyday lives it was it was really difficult at some point and after i finished my phd i decided to kind of shift my focus a little bit um, I'm an artist too. Uh, I'm a research and artist and writer. And um, since the end of my PhD, so since like the beginning of 2018, I've been uh, mostly working as an artist. Um, and uh, in my artistic practice, I've been looking instead into something that I kind of stumbled upon or came upon, um, or that appeared again in my life, let's say during my PhD research, which was um, herbal medicine and um, uh, care practices like intracommunal forms of care, of radical care, that, um, that of course, you know, coming from Brazil, um, herbal medicine is something that is present, but it was um, almost like a re-encounter with that after my PhD. And uh, um, I guess a, a, a moment where that became um, part of my life in a way, because I needed, to, you know, after seeing all that history of violence, I personally also needed to um, to be able to see something that gave me a little bit of of hope more. So I guess that's kind of a a, a very rough overview. And I've been working with these uh, these like herbalist practices ever since, and it's actually been very a very beautiful journey and a very beautiful opportunity to to do that and engaging with those knowledges too. So that's kind of an overview. Thank you, Luisa. And I'm really sorry that I'm keeping you very short with these introductions, but that's because. I want to discuss more with you <laughs> and uh, I'm really happy. Thanks to the audience. We are already receiving some questions. So it's really great that we are already sprouting some kind of uh, discussion and, and uh, we will be posting them when, yeah, in our par uh, last part of the, of the talk. But I have one uh, question to you, Luisa, before we open up uh, for the three of you. Uh, I mean, it's something that we discussed a little bit, of course, when we were preparing for this uh, 
talk and it's a big question but just uh, I wanted to touch upon it and we see whether we expand later uh, like given the complexity of the reproductive justice in the global south uh, and in the light of the body empowerment how can we at all talk about choice uh, this is also something that interests you a lot in your practice uh, and uh, I'm really curious what you I want to comment this yeah, that's that's a really, really important aspect of it, because so often when we talk about reproductive health care, um, the conversation is framed around choice, around the concept of choice. But um, I guess, you know, an example of that that I came across in, in my research, and it's really what kind of like got me all into this uh, path of like herbalist medicine and so on. Um, so I came across this historical document um, by Maria, Maria Sibylla Marion, a naturalist um, that went to the Americas in the 1600s. And in this document, she describes the use of a plant called the peacock flower by indigenous and African enslaved peoples as a way of provoking abortions. And what she writes in the document that um that people told her was that this was a way of preventing that their children would have the same fate of being enslaved and suffering all those violences so when you think about it um in a situation like this what is choice when you know there the the very um conditions for life to actually happen for um for people to have a, a dignified life are not there and this is something that, of course, is also present in the work of a lot of feminists of color, um, uh, particularly as a critique to white feminist understandings of choice. You know, um, Angela Davis talks a lot about that too. Um, she mentions uh, in Women Recent Class um, very kind of similar uh, framings. You know, what is choice when um, when there isn't uh, when people don't have access to the very basic thing that they need to be able to choose or not to have children, um, from housing to healthcare to uh, to education. So for me, um, thinking about uh, reproduction and fertility and um, how these colonial structures of power intervene in that is. A conversation that is way broader than just talking strictly about um like biological processes but it is a conversation that goes through um through all of this through like the structures that allow people to be able to live properly thank you uh yeah it's <laughs> It's a really vast, uh, vast question that that uh, we, yeah, we will not really have completely time to address today. But uh, I'm just thinking of how to maybe continue now and include, like, with the discussion. And one thing we also all uh, touched upon, and you already, Inga and Julia, mentioned a bit. Uh, and Luisa as well, but I would like to maybe go deeper. Uh, first, uh, as artists, uh, you got drawn, dra drawn into this topic from many different points of interest or, or life situations, as it usually uh, goes. Uh, but uh, how this, I'm curious, how did this work? Uh, as you said, you're not professional, but, you know, as sometimes we go through research, we become professionals and uh but it goes back and forth so basically how did this work also affect your previous work and uh, your position as an artist i know that you have all thought about it and uh, also it's part of your statement so yeah if you like to maybe comment on this yeah i have the feeling i'm still grappling um because i like also when we had our pre-conversation, um, there's a lot of information that's just very like strong and very heavy. And I appreciate so much that you expand the notion of choice because it's such a 
slogan on of feminist reproductive uh, struggles, right? And I really appreciate, Luisa, that you brought in the scope of saying, like, what choice are we speaking about? What's a reproductive choice if the perspectives of how we live um, are um, so unequal? And, um, and at the same time, I'm just like with with an understanding how many um, like second fem second wave feminist positions that I do not want to like um, compare like that they have a lot of lags but I still that um, what is very important for for all of us when we um, when we are confronted with this overwhelming um, truth that you are speaking about uh, I still have the feeling what we can do and what we must do is to find strategies how we can politicize our own relation to healthcare, right? Uh, I can imagine you have the same thing and for, for me for sure it was like that, that the long way of understanding that um, like things that happen in my body and the way I consult medical services is a political thing in itself and the way I speak about my body and the way I am informing myself about what I have the right to ask for and what is a respectful treatment. It, these were very important steps, I think, for each one of us to understand. And the second step is then to understand, and I think it counts very much for the German healthcare system, to understand, in my case, what privilege comes along with my position in the German healthcare system. So gaining an understanding how unequally distributed power positions are in the healthcare system how uh, underrepresented uh, people of color are in, um, in power position in, as psychiatrists or as therapists, or having uh, access to the Krankenkassenzulassung, like being with permission to practice within the health insurance. So I have the feeling if we, um, if we begin our journey into politicizing our own experiences of health and are able to move beyond um, that idea that um, when we move beyond our own position, I think this is a very, um, maybe it's the only powerful thing we can do to relate to what are very um, yeah, devastating, intimidating and saddening realities um, in relation to healthcare in, uh, yeah, on a global scale. Any of you want to uh, continue? Just please go ahead. Uh, we can't hear you. Julia, would you uh, like to speak or? Um, maybe you can go first, if you like. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of how this has affected my, my practice, for me, it's been I think um, a process of that led me to question so many things and so many narratives, so many established narratives, let's say, which is part of a of of course of a process. Um, you know, when we talk about established narratives and hegemonic narratives, we're talking also about colonial narratives, the narratives of patriarchy, and so on and so forth. All these kind of entangled um, 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 structures of power. And uh, for me, it's been um, a process of deconstructing that in terms of also understanding what is knowledge and what is recognized as knowledge, right? Um, I said that uh, I was doing that as part of my, my PhD and uh, um, it started, you know, with, uh, with kind of an engagement with, um, with decolonial theories um during during this like uh doctoral research and uh, and that led me to question even um uh, like when when you talk about like herbalist knowledges it's something that is often not uh not understood as like actual knowledge or real science or real medicine when uh but when you go into it, this actually is, I mean, it's, uh, I don't know, like 
basically what I want to say is it led me to even engage with the knowledges that like, my grandmother had and my great grandmother. Um, they were both they both um, did practice herbal medicine to some extent, um, which is not uncommon in Brazil. But this is something that with the so-called industrialization and so-called development of the country also kind of stayed back. So I didn't learn that and my mother didn't learn. And I, I mean, if my mother didn't learn, I, I learned even less, you know, even though I did, you know, my, my grandmother did, um, did, um, preparations for us when we we're sick and so on. So it's uh, it was a very interesting process of also engaging with those kind of ancestral knowledges and uh, and um, understanding that also uh, knowledge is or it became even clear how knowledge is not only uh, created and developed and so on within the confines, let's say, of like academic institutions and, uh, and so on. So that to me was very beautiful. And that's what I've been doing in, in my artistic practice, really. Like I, I talk about my grandmothers all the time in my artistic practice and I've been engaging with that history. Thanks, Louisa. <laughs> <laughs> Yulia, you also wanted to? Uh, I can just add maybe to, to what Inga was saying, and thank you, Luisa, for saying this. We, we, I, it was very, um, I, I can uh, say that I also, uh, for me, it was like a unlearning and relearning and, and also this aspect of who, who creates knowledge and who, uh, who, who can we learn from? This is like, there was like such a shift in, in what I was like, we, for example, there was the, the crip movement and now the, like, there's a lot of um, um, activists in like disability rights activists that we can learn from. And actually at around the same time that, my, that we, that the health feminist healthcare research group was founded, my first uh, child was born and he is like, what is called, like what is labeled as disabled. And uh, so there was these, all these issues that co were coming together and um, there was like, I developed this huge interest and in the research group we also um went into like looking at who can we learn from and who can like which kind of knowledge is it that actually uh, enriches us and enriches our um understanding of in this case health but also in ex in sharing knowledge and in um yeah being together forming um, um like structures of support of mutual support yeah yeah let me Thank add to you. this Elena, just uh -huh. please, please please go ahead may I? Yeah, yeah. because i think we are spanning such huge topics that it maybe it's good that we just land somewhere also that i was just recalling also adding to julia that um in the beginning of the feminist health healthcare research group i was so often checking with myself um whether i should be embarrassed that we share so many personal things and this was part of this process of unlearning. Like uh, I did spend a great deal of time understanding what I learned in my art education without realizing that this is what I was learning and that I was trained to perceive certain things as artistic and as valid that um, I couldn't fully decode what actually I was internalizing. And I think this is a very long way for all of us to understand what we are taught and how ingrained it is with exclusions, for instance, of um, it is just a very sad um, realization when you understand how excluded people with disabilities have been from knowledge production for, uh, yeah, for centuries as well. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to um, briefly blend over to um, this has a lot of consequences, of course, to the way we are working today as artists, right? The way we understand that we are um, employed in a system that is entirely based on competitiveness, um, where we are often competing with each other. The art field has a culture of invisible power structures where we can't share uh, our um, care obligations, the way we feel our vulnerabilities, um, where we neglect care work and we hide our children and we hide our 
uh, chronic illnesses. And I have the feeling this is a work we are engaging in with each other to change those spaces. And um, those spaces, of course, have a structural dimension, the way we look at who is running uh, the institutions we are invited by, um, but also what is the culture that we establish with each other when we talk to each other, when we do work together, when we set ourselves deadlines, um, when we reward each other for collaborating. So I think this is also where this engagement with um, the politics of healthcare have concrete effects in the way we are positioned as, as cultural workers today. Am I on? Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I also, yeah, with this series, we always uh, jump from one topic to the other, but I think slowly we are also having a little uh, uh, circle of at least getting to to know, you know, also the motives behind and uh, how somehow we end, we, we land into a certain field from, yeah, many different reasons, but uh, at the end is uh, what you make of it and how you, in a way, ex, you know, materialize it as, as you are doing in your work. So I'm uh, thinking here, I'm torn between the questions that I'm getting from the audience and the questions that, that I also have myself, but maybe we can, uh, I will read few few questions here and we can pick up on that and maybe at the end, uh, yeah, I will ask uh, some of my questions that are still unasked. So one first question is uh, to Yulia and Inga. Uh, have you started to think alone or collectively with others about what autonomous health means in times of, in times of pandemic and the question of uh, vaccines? I'm asking carefully, not wanting to start a pro or anti-vaccine discussion, but raising the issue of auto autonomy in that context. Uh, hope that's okay. And... Uh, yeah, maybe we can just go with this and then we check on some other. Please go ahead. Maybe I can just briefly start like we have we don't um, position ourselves in relation to vaccines. I've also been asked recently how feminist healthcare research group is pro or con um, like the COVID measures. This is not where we position ourselves. Um, I have the feeling like what happened to us when we were um, like as everybody else, like totally taken by surprise by this pandemic um, expanding, that we um, were drawing on a lot of knowledge by um, CRIP activists, for instance, Lia Lakshmi Pizna Samarazinha, who wrote the book Care Work, um, where we felt so many people have been dealing with questions how to survive like cases of health emergency for their entire lives. And so many people with disabilities and chronic illnesses are since a long time already coping with how do I organize the help that I need? How do I find the assistance that I need? That I feel there are histories of dealing with this um, emergency of healthcare um, that we are learning from a lot. And I have the feeling that the pandemic was rather um, like um, revealing how many people are much more vulnerable in this pandemic and um, how the conditions of the pandemic have, for instance, people who have limited mobility um, had already a lot of knowledge how to do things online, how to meet online, so forth. So I understand the pandemic more as a moment of revealing already existing vulnerabilities that we haven't paid attention to before as a society as a whole, um, also giving us a chance to value that hard-won knowledge even more. And secondly, um, we observed a lot that usually crises, health crises, are experienced as individual um, lags, failures, pauses, where in this case, um, I believe for a lot of people, it really made a difference that while I was failing or my, my routine was collapsing, it was the same for a lot of other people at the same time. So the experience of crisis is not as just an individual thing. Maybe this briefly from, from us. Maybe when we are talking about um, the, the um, 
contraceptive implants. Maybe you have much more of a perspective on this, Luisa. I'm, I'm just wondering right now. Yeah, I mean, should, should we go into that now? Because that's... Uh... If you want, I mean, if you want to, yeah, briefly, why not? This was also one mm -hmm. of the questions that I had, but then, uh, yeah. We can mix now the questions from the audience and also among you as well. It's really great if you have questions for each other as well. Please mm -hmm. go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, definitely one of the things that I uh, have been kind of concerning myself with is, you know, how, as I mentioned, the design of certain things and the design of certain uh, devices, certain technologies also affects the way or, or the possibilities for enforcement um, of that particular um, um, technology and uh, um, or medicine. And one example I think that is very clear is uh, the, the difference between like pills and implants, right? So, of course, um, as I mentioned, the pill is something that you have to take every day. The intake regime of a pill is very specific. You have to take it pretty much, you know, uh, preferably at the same hour every day. And um, there is, you know, the 21-day the regime followed by the, the pause. So that is like a very particular way of, of uh, taking a medication, if you think about it. But from the moment that you take, you know, the same molecules, the same uh, active compounds, and you make that into an implant, that you need someone um, specialized to put it um, in, it's typically put in the inside part of the arm. Um, so when you, where you need like a medical intervention to insert it and another medical intervention to remove it, and it's something that is supposed to last for like, three years or so, that changes things. Because then people cannot just decide I'm not taking it anymore from one day to the next, like the pill. And that creates different possibilities. So one of the, uh, for instance, the first birth control implant that was uh, released commercially was called Norplant. And uh, I think the history of Norplant kind of illustrates that very well. So as soon as it came out, Norplant, um, there were so many things that happened. I mean, um, there was, for instance, uh, an OPAD, uh, like a, a, an opinion piece in the Philadelphia Inquirer that came out saying, um, suggesting that maybe this implant was, and this is a quote, the solution to black poverty. So here we see an openly genocidal uh, uh, proposal being published in a newspaper. And again, you know, upholding uh, structures of racial oppression and, and so on. There was also a case of a woman that was uh, found guilty of child abuse. And as part of her sentencing, the judge uh, determined that she should have a, an implant uh, inserted in, in her so she would not get pregnant. So there's numerous, numerous cases of that. You know, um, in the case of um, the birth control pill and the development of this, you see these, um, these structures happening kind of in the development phase very much. Um, ultimately, uh, also a uh, scholar, philosopher, Paul Preciado, he, I think he uh, summarizes it very well. He says that People in Puerto Rico, this colony, which is a colony to this day, right? People in Puerto Rico were used to test a medication that ultimately was not even meant for them. It was meant to benefit the middle-class white housewife of um, so-called developed nations, particularly the United States. Whereas um, an implant like that, or um, these kinds of other technologies, they open up these other possibilities, right, of, um, of maintaining and continuing these, um, these structures of oppression. And uh, yeah, I think the, the implant is very clear. And then we have even developments in that. Over the past, oof, at this point, I would say, I've been accompanying the story for 
I don't know, seven years, I don't know anymore. But um, over the past few years, I've been following the development of um, a birth control chip that um, it started um, in the MIT, actually. Um, Bill Gates was visiting the MIT and, uh, at, you know, he was checking out everything that was happening there, I guess. They were showing him around and he came uh, across um, this lab where people were developing this implant that was supposed to, de to deliver um, medication for a long time. Um, the initial idea for this implant, the, the initial concept, was that it would be something for diabetes, for people who need um, diabetes, medication for diabetes, which is, you know, it's something that you need for a very long period of time, and it's a chronic, um, it's a chronic illness. But um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is very active in uh, promoting a series of um, of uh, uh, so-called reproductive uh, healthcare um, initiatives in the global south, and uh, since uh, then, or for for a few years after that, they um, they uh, injected quite a lot of money in that um, in that lab and in that startup called Microchips. Uh, so they would make that into a remote controlled, I think I forgot to say this, it's supposed to be um, controlled by an app. So this remote controlled um, rep or, or a birth control implant, which, you know, if we think about the history of the Norplant and kind of extend that and think about the persistence of, um, of these uh, forms of reproductive violence, um, it becomes clear that something like that is presents like a lot of ethical um very complicated ethical repercussions so yeah that's kind of something that i guess is worth mentioning in that sense yeah thank you for yeah this uh getting into this direction um I'm thinking I'll skip commenting because I would like to take uh, two more questions uh, from the audience, which today is really active. Uh, but I will try to merge them and ask you to give me shorter answers because, uh, yeah, the time is really running. So I will merge uh, two in one for you, Luisa. Yeah. Uh, one is uh, one question is. Uh, uh, Puerto Rico is still a colony of the USA. How does this type of, uh, I mean, you touched upon now basically, but still medical dehumanization still happened there. Uh, healthcare seems to be a big problem there, visibly so after Hurricane Maria. And I wonder what the legacy is, if you can talk uh, to it based on research or field work you might have done there or in the other colonial polities. And then uh, I will also merge it with this. Uh, are you aware of, uh, because it's also an occurring problem, are you aware of any solidarity networks or solidarity practices supporting women who can't get abortions legally in their places of residence? Unfortunately, I will have to ask you to be brief, even though these are, yeah, huge uh, questions. Uh, should, should I? Yeah, please uh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, in terms of solidarity networks, um, I would really encourage people to look up the work of Chocha Baja, uh, which is an organization um, that is that does uh, amazing work, and uh, and that is uh, located here in Europe, um, and a solidarity network between um, Poland and Germany. And uh, there's also Women on Web and Women Help Women which are two organizations that provide um, abortion health care for people who don't have access to it um, anywhere in the world. Uh, so, um, and they've been doing uh, amazing work over the past year. So I would super, super recommend that you look into that. And um, uh, what else? The, the question of Puerto Rico. Unfortunately, I haven't had the opportunity to go there yet. <laughs> but hopefully I plan to to go and to continue doing some research into that. Um, I'm more familiar with um, 
the articulation of these networks and uh, of all of that in Brazil, which is obviously where I come from. So I'm more familiar with the like on the ground grassroots work in Brazil. Uh, thank you. And I think the last one uh, goes to probably Yulia or Inga, whoever wants to pick it up. Uh, do you see potential to integrate? And if so, how to integrate different types of knowledge, lay expert alternative within a healthcare system? And another one that kind of merges as a community organizer, I'm curious about ways to help building generative long-term health networks among peers. So just a quick reflection on this, and then we will have to close <laughs> soon. <laughs> I can maybe start briefly and Inga, you jump in. Yeah. I was just thinking of um, like um, practices like the GECO, the uh, Health Collective that is founding now a health center in Berlin, Neukölln, which um, like it's supposed to be a health and social center um, to give advice also on other topics that are related to health, but not like a medical knowledge um, uh, specifically. And um, there were in the health movement, the health um, centers, the Gesundheitsläden, where um, people of all all um, all types of knowledge were kind of getting together to exchange also on this topic of health, for example. And Inga, add, <laughs> please. Yeah, I can just add the BLAG, for instance. It was the Berliner Infoladen für Arbeit und Gesundheit, the Berlin Info Center for Work and Health, where, for instance, workers would come to the Gesundheitsladen, to the health center, and they would get advice how they could challenge the health conditions in their workplaces. So there have been actually models how lay people and experts could work together or how patients could organize in patients' organizations to work for their rights, which is very often necessary when people are harmed by the medical complex. Um, yes, so yeah, I can imagine a future with that. I think we should work towards this. Great, thank you all. Uh, we are approaching till the end of this planned hour. So unfortunately now I will have to close this uh, discussion that is just starting. But uh, thank you so much for sharing your insights uh, with us and for this amazing conversation. And I'm pretty sure we will continue it on some other occasion. So uh, at the very end, uh, as I said, I'm happy to share with you our next events, uh, which is our uh, upcoming 23rd conference uh, behind the mask uh, whistleblowing during the pandemic, which will actually tackle the, will present the acts of whistleblowing in times of Corona and expose practices that were dangerous to public health during the pandemic. The program will focus on the activity of whistleblowers, scientists, journalists, and human rights activists, uh, also artists and researchers. Uh, all of them are basically denouncing abuses and wrongdoing in the course of the COVID-19 crisis and beyond. So please follow us for this. Uh, as I said, it will be free, online, streamed uh, from the 18th till 20th of March 2021. Uh, so now I will pass the word uh, to my colleague Lieke, uh, Lieke Pfluger, who will moderate the next uh, disruption, Disruptive Friday to tell us uh, what that edition will be about and uh, how we continue next. So thanks a lot from me and Lieke, the floor is yours. All right. Yeah. Also, many thanks to you, Elena, for this amazing session and also to the other speakers of today. That was super interesting. Um, so yeah, I'll also keep it short because we're almost out of time, but I wanted to also say briefly that we're actually going to kick off the community program of the Disruption Lab next Wednesday, the 17th of February. And this is a warm-up meetup that we're doing as a preparation for the Behind the Mask conference. And uh, it will uh, be focusing on um, the topic of Amazon and the whistleblower Chris Smalls that was uh, recently in the news. Um, so the meetup is called Amazon Unmasked Workers' Rights During the Pandemic. And we'll speak with Amazon whistleblower uh, Chris Smalls, who's also the co-founder of the Congress of Essential Workers. Also together with activist Jonathan Miller of the Berlin versus Amazon and the Tech Workers Coalition here in Berlin. Um, yeah, so Chris was fired from Amazon in March 2020 after he organized an, a walkout of employees in a protest against their working conditions during the pandemic. 
and he will address his experience during the meetup and also how he's doing an ongoing fight for better working conditions and fair wages for essential workers. And Jonathan Miller will share his local perspective from being involved in these groups in Berlin. And the meetup is free to attend. We still have some spots available, so you can sign up via our website since we have limited spots. And then, yeah, finally, the next Disruptive Friday. So we're going to continue with a bi-weekly schedule from now on. So the next Disruptive Friday will be on the 26th of February, always as usual at 5 p.m. Berlin time. And in this edition, we're going to focus on the different ways that some of our project partners of the project Reimagine Europe that we've been part of for a while, uh, how they are working on involving community in their space and in their work. So we can understand better how uh, different community groups can be involved with and use uh, such art spaces. And in this edition, we've invited people from uh, the Bergen Kunsthal in Norway. So we'll be hearing more from them, from Scott Elliott and also from the art space Lighthouse in Brighton in the UK. And yeah, we will announce the full program on our website very soon. And of course, we hope to see you there again. And uh, thanks a lot to everybody for joining today also uh, in the very lively chat, which is amazing. So many thanks and see you in the next one.